when you become a professor, when you eventually be, are told by your university that you've reached that high status, they say, what do, you become, what do you want to become a professor of? And when I was asked this question, it really became evident to me that the thing that I'm most passionate about is not neuroscience per se, but the applications that neuroscience has in the real world. Because as you begin to understand what your brain's doing, then I believe that you can work better with it. My real passion is, if we can get this to kids, then, my goodness, you know, that's 50, 60, 70 years of them being able to use this stuff. So being, being able to tell teachers about it is fantastic because then, hopefully, you'll be able to take this back into the classroom and use it. So with that in mind, what I thought might be useful today is to start by thinking about neuroplasticity. And by neuroplasticity, all we mean is neural, the components of the brain, and plasticity, it's like plasticine. What can we change and what can we do with our brains? And to talk about this, I want to take you back to um, genetics. How many of you remember doing genetics at school? Could anybody define what genetics is? Genetic information from both of your parents. Just explained it to my year sevens. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. So it's taking information from both of your parents, yes, and combining it in a way that makes a unique human being. And to do that, we use DNA. Yeah? So you have one strand of DNA from your mother, one strand of DNA from your father. And you know, I always thought that, well, you just got all of one strand from mum and all of one strand from dad. No, 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 no. Within any one of your chromosomes, parts of it will be from your mum and parts of it will be from your dad. So it's, it's kind of really mixed up. And that's why you're such a unique human being, because you've got this mixture of DNA. But what does DNA do? And I think, you know, for me, this is a little bit surprising, because all that DNA can do is... <laughs> um, it joins it together, the nucleotides. So so you, you, you can decode a strand of DNA, you get from that a string of amino acids, and the amino acids fold up and make proteins. And that's all that DNA does. So DNA doesn't direct behavior. DNA doesn't do all these things that we think it does. It creates proteins. The proteins are put together as factories, and the factories do the work of creating the cells in your body. And you then begin to think, well, OK, so that, that that's what DNA is doing. How come if every cell in my body has all of the components of DNA, all 23 chromosomes, how come this bit turns into a skin cell and another bit turns into a piece of retina and another bit turns into a, mu a, a muscle in my heart? So each of the, the parts of your, your body are decoding that DNA in a slightly different way. Yeah, makes sense? How do we do that? How do we um, manage that? And to begin to think about this, we need to move from genetics to epigenetics. And I think epigenetics is one of my favorite things in, in the whole of the English language. It's a wonderful thing. It's the, the study of how we decode different bits of DNA. But not only that, it's the study of how we can change what parts of the DNA we code over our own lifespan. And to think about this, we need to understand you know, that the DNA, I, I thought, you know, you've got your nucleus and your DNA is in the nucleus of every cell. And I thought it just stood, it was in strands, but it's not. It looks like this. There's protein blocks called histones, and the DNA is wrapped around these protein blocks. Now, there's a really good reason for that. It means that some of the DNA is effectively being tied up. It's going to be really difficult to decode that bit of the DNA because it's wrapped up, and some of it is loose. And now any cell can wrap up the bits it doesn't need and leave loose the bits that it does need. Yeah, so the, the way that DNA is wrapped in your skin cell is different from the way that it's wrapped in your retina, is different from the way that it's wrapped in a, a cell in your heart. 
And that means that each of these cells build different factories and can produce the cell type that they, they're, they're wanting. And you're probably at this point you're thinking, well, why do I need to know this? The thing that's really fascinating about this is that you can change the wrapping of your DNA within your lifetime. It's not fixed. So this is a way that you can change your brain, your body, all sorts of things. Um, and let me give you a kind of um, silly example of that first. Imagine you went to the gym and you lifted weights with and exercised just this muscle. What would happen? You'd look a bit lopsided after a while, wouldn't you? Because you'd build muscle here, but you wouldn't build muscle anywhere else. So locally within this muscle, you've sent a signal to the cells to say, we need more muscle fibers. And to do that, you'll unwrap an extra bit of DNA that will allow you to build more muscle fibers. Yeah? So by the experiences that we're having, we're sending signals to our bodies, to our brains, to say, we need something different here. And epigenetics takes control of the fact that we can change that. And just to give you a, a bit of, a, of another piece of information, we do it by adding um, chemicals, um, acetyl, methyl, um, different chemicals to either the DNA or to the histones. Um, and they will change the wrapping. So some of, some of these chemicals wrap things tighter. If you don't want to lose information, some of them make the wrapping looser so that you can do something else with that piece of DNA. You know you can send your DNA off to get, um, to find out about your, your heritage. Yeah, anybody done this? Yeah, there's a few people, yeah. So one of the things that they see when they're looking at this is how many changes, how many of these acetyl groups and methyl groups have been added to your DNA. And basically from that, they can tell whether you've had a really boring life and haven't changed very much at all, or a really exciting life, and there's lots of these additions to your DNA, which means that you've changed lots of things in your life during your lifespan. So it's a record of all the experiences that you've had and the way that your, your body and your brain has had to adapt to that. It's amazing. So I absolutely love this stuff. Right, so the, one of the reasons I'm telling you this is because it begins to give us that, that understanding of things can change. Whether we're newborns or whether we're older adults, things can change. And the question for me then is, well, what can we do with our brains? What's available to be changed in the brain? And to talk about this, I want to just mention briefly neurons. Before, if I go back, how many of you would have been able to draw a neuron for me? <laughs> yes, we've got one, yeah, two, yeah, a little bit, yeah. Um, <clears throat> and this is typical of, of um, people that I talk to. It's, it's something that's just not known. And yet, it's the fundamental building block that you're using to educate your children. So understanding what it is and how it works can give you an idea of what it is you're playing with when you're um, creating new learning. What is it that the, the kids are actually doing? So this is a neuron. And it has four and a, and a bit components. You can come to here. What's a, new, a neuron, what's it for? What's it actually doing? Transfer it's transferring information, absolutely. And that's all it does. It takes information from one place and takes it someplace else. And then as it takes in information in and puts it out, it integrates from different places. So to do that, you need some way of getting information into the neuron. And that's these finger-like project projections called dendrites that are at the top of the neurons. The neuron, this is the top, this is the bottom. Okay? So these finger-like projections are fed into by lots of other neurons in the network, and that way they're taking in the information from lots of different places. The next bit is the cell body. We need a cell body because we need a nucleus. We need a nucleus because we need the, the chromosomes, the DNA, to build the factories 
that will produce all the components of the neuron. And then because we're taking information from one place to another, we need a wire. And the axon, this long extension from the cell body, is the wire that takes information from one place and takes it to someplace else. Now, the lovely thing about the neuron is it's, it's really flexible in, in how it looks. And form follows function. So if you imagine a giraffe, and there's one neuron that goes from the giraffe's foot to its spinal cord. Imagine how long that wire needs to be, that axon needs to be really, really long to, to do that. But in other places, just... Just get my, my spare brain out, I always carry a spare. You imagine this, this chunk of the brain here has six layers in it. Just, just that piece that's that thick has six different layers. And you'll have neurons that connect up across layers. So there the axons need to be millimeters. Yeah? So this is something where it's very flexible and you can change the shape to fit the function. So we've got our axon and just the, the extra little bit of that is, um, imagine you went home tonight and some pixie had taken all the insulation off every wire in your house, would you be happy? No. No, would not be a good thing. And I'm talking about wires in our brains and I'm talking about wires that carry electrical activity. So just as we use insulation to make sure that um, you don't get short circuiting in your house, we use insulation in our axons to make sure that we don't short circuit in our brains. And there's a fatty sheath called myelin that's wrapped around the axon. And that makes the axon more efficient, but it also makes it safer, basically. It's not um, touching other axons that are also carrying electrical activity. Um, myelination is a developmental process. So the neurons at the back of the brain, this is the visual cortex, will myelinate earlier than the neurons at the front of the brain. There's a progression of myelination that goes from um, back to front. Here at the back, you're probably getting full myelination by the time kids are what, between three and five. This is the bit of the brain at the front that does thinking and decision making and planning. When do you think you might get full myelination here? Sorry? When we teach. When you teach, you're encouraging myelination by teaching because you're setting up the pathways. What age do you think you might get full myelination? Yeah. You're probably talking mid to late teens, yeah? And this is one of the reasons that, that younger children don't make such good decisions because their brains are not fully myelinated yet. So that's one of the developmental processes that's going on. Okay, so we've got myelination and then we've got an output. So the axon terminals at the end of the neuron send information out to the next neurons in the chain. And that's, that's basically what a neuron does. So can we create new neurons? And the answer is yes, we can create new neurons. Now, this is just one study, and we'll tell you about another one. So under what circumstances might we create new neurons? This is a study where they raised um, rats, either in very enriched environments, environments where there was lots for the rats to do. There's, you can see there's wheels, there's places for them to forage, They've got other rats with them. Um, so it's a very social and um, fun environment. This is how we normally um, keep rats in, in the lab. They're always in groups because rats are very social and so we, we keep them in, in groups. We give them adequate food and water. We give them sawdust for their um, bedding. And if they're really lucky, they get a single toy, which is usually the inside of a toilet roll. Yeah, we're really you know, good with our rats. And you can see that, that when you raise animals in these different environments, it has an, an impact on the number of neurons that they create. Enriched environments cause the construction of more neurons. If you're in an enriched environment, there's more to learn, and therefore you just get more material to, to save that information. 
Yeah? So we can create new neurons. Unfortunately, we can't create new neurons everywhere in the brain. So if I was only to give you one thing, one function, that you could um, use new neurons for, what would you want to do with them? Long-term memory. Long-term memory. Yeah. So you want to be able to use them to remember things that, that, you could, um, that you had done. And that's exactly what happens. This part of the brain, which looks a bit like a wish, wishbone, is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is where you store the addresses of your long-term memories. And that's the part of the brain that is one of the parts of the brain that, that you can create new neurons in. So we don't do it everywhere, but we do do it for long-term memory. Um, you might wonder too, do we do it just as much in adults as we do in kids? I mean, is there an advantage? Can ki are kids more flexible in this than adults? And the study that says that adults can actually create lots of new neurons was performed on London taxi drivers. Has anybody heard of this study? No? It's, okay, so London taxi drivers. In order to become a London taxi driver, you have to pass a test called the knowledge. And the knowledge is basically every street in London, whether it's one way or two way, what times of day it's busy and what times of day it's quiet. So it's basically a spatial temporal map of the whole of London. And when you're examined on the knowledge, you're given a, um, a starting point and a destination and a time of day, and you're asked, what's the fastest route from A to B? Okay, so you really have to have a working knowledge of, of this map. And um, one of the memory researchers thought, that would be really interesting, because there's a place where adults have to store a huge amount of new information. What happens to the hippocampus as they're doing it? So they brought London taxi drivers into the lab and they scanned their brains and they looked at the size of the hippocampus in relation to how long they had been a taxi driver. So they had some novice taxi drivers, some taxi drivers that have been working for many, many, many years. And basically the size of the hippocampus increased with the length of time that they had been a London taxi driver. So not only can you see that they're creating new neurons, but it's sufficient that you can actually measure a change in the size of the hippocampus. If you've got a reason to store a lot of new information, your brain will, will provide you with the resource to do that. Isn't that brilliant? <laughs> it's really, really useful to know. OK, so that's new neurons. But that's only giving you things that you can remember. And we, we learn skills. We learn other things as well. So what else is there that can change in the brain that will give us that ability? And here we have to talk about the synapse. And the synapse is where two neurons meet. It's where the output from one meets the input into the next neuron. So here we have one neuron coming down and connecting into a second neuron that's going that way. And this is just a, a blow up of what's happening at that place. And as you go down one neuron, there's electrical activity gets to the end. And what it does is it causes these bubbles to release a chemical into the synaptic gap. So the gap between what the neuron going in and the neuron coming out. And that neurotransmitter is picked up by the next neuron in the chain in receptors, and the receptors change the electrical activity of that neuron. So we go electrical activity, chemical activity, electrical activity. Yeah? That's, that's the, the chain of events. Um, let me cover first. It's, it's, you know, when you start to think about that, think, OK, that's, that's slightly odd. There are animals that connect everything up electrically. There isn't, they, they don't have this electrical, chemical, electrical change. They just do it electrically. So, and if the 
in order to do that chemical, sorry, electrical, chemical, electrical, you expend more energy and you waste a little bit of time. Yeah? And as soon as you start thinking about that, my, my think immediately go to what's the evolutionary benefit of doing that? Why would we do that? Why would we not just connect everything up electrically and be done with it? So what do you gain from doing electrical, chemical, electrical? Any ideas? Why has evolution come up with this way of doing things? It's adaptable. And can you say a little bit more? In what way will it allow you to adapt? You're absolutely right. Flexibility. Yep, yep. So if you imagine that you've tied it up electrically, this neuron fires, what will happen to the next one? It will fire too. If you do it with a chemical gap in the middle, what have you done? You've changed that. So the beauty of this is you've turned something that was a switch into a volume control. I can now turn either turn the next neuron in the chain up, but I can also turn it down. If I use the right chemical, I can inhibit what's happening next. I can turn it down. Um, if I use a different chemical, I can excite it. I can turn it up. So we can change the electrical activity in the next cell in both directions. And that gives us much, much more flexibility. Um, your brains are all using this flexibility as you listen to me now. So what you will be doing is you'll be focusing on what you need to achieve your goal. And I hope your goal is to understand something that I'm saying. In order to do that, your brain has turned off other information that you could be attending to. You've got too much to attend to, so it's turned some of it off. And until I tell you, you will not be aware of the feeling of your legs on the chair. As soon as I bring your attention to it, you can all feel it now, yeah? But because it's not relevant to listening to me, that will be turned down. And this is what we mean by, you know, the brain has that extra flexibility. We can turn things up, we can turn things down. Um, and that, that allows us to focus our attention on the things that are most important in the moment. OK, so we've got these synapses. Now, we can build new synapses. What's the benefit? If you think of something that's a habit for you, what do you all do that's just a click where? When I see this, I do that. You all think of something that's a habit. Does it, it could be a good habit. It doesn't need to be a bad habit. You know, when I see my, um, my grandchildren, I smile. I cannot stop. Yeah? So there are things that we do that, have, that are just automatic. And in automatic behaviors, the number of synapses between the sensory input, that's something you're hearing or something you're seeing, seeing and the behavior is that there's m many, many millions of synapses. The more synapses you have in a pathway, the more automatic the behavior becomes. So as we practice different skills, we build the number of synapses in the pathway, and the skill becomes more and more automatic. There's a real benefit in building synapses. So what can we do with that? And this study is one of the ones that blew my brains when I just realized what, we were, what it was saying. It's not what I'd expected. It's one of these places where the brain is doing something that's, a little, um, that's not intuitive. So what you are looking at here on the that you're right is a photograph of the inside of a mouse brain, a living mouse brain, okay? And what the researchers have done is they put in a little bit of dye so that these um, bright blotches here, each of those is an individual synapse. You're looking at the individual synapses on a single neuron in a mouse brain, okay? Now, because the mouse is active and, and doing things, what you can do is you can take a photograph every 20 minutes, and you can see what changes. And if you look at where the arrow is here, what you'll see is there's no synapse here. There's still no synapse here. 
But here I hope you'll see that there's an extra synapse that's appeared. Can you all see that? So within the space of 20 minutes, within 10 or so minutes, that mouse has built a synapse. Now that's great, because that says we can build synapses in real time. So when you get a new piece of information, you can build a synapse to hold that piece of information. That kind of um, concurred with what I thought would happen. But what I had assumed was that once you built a synapse, you kept it. And what the study showed was they counted how many synapses were gained or lost in a 24-hour period. And what they showed was that 20% of this mouse synapse and my synapse were gained or lost in 24 hours. 20% in 24 hours. Now that's massive. That means that if it's a random process, you're replacing all of the synapses in that part of the mouse brain in five days. Complete overhaul of every synapse. And that, you know, just didn't, I'm thinking that's really bizarre. Again, huge energy commitment, huge energy commitment to keep rebuilding synapses. So why? What do you gain by rebuilding the synapses? If we don't use uh, information we have, then we lose it. Okay, so it's a way of being able to forget as, as well as remember. If there are things that you're not using, then you can just get rid of those synapses and not rebuild them. Absolutely. Anything else? What does it imply about what your brain is doing? Sorry? Selection? Selection? There's an expectation. If it's waiting, if it's building new synapses, 20% of you, not maybe slightly less, we don't have the same metabolic rate as a mouse, but even if you said 10 to, 12, uh, to 14 days, you replace all your synapses, the expectation is that new information will be available, that there will be a reason to have those new synapses. So if you do the same thing yesterday and today and tomorrow, then you use all of that resource to build exactly the same synapses as you had two days ago. You just replace the ones that you had. It's only if you do something new every day that you actually use that capacity. And when I realized that, it was like, boom. <laughs> you know, I've always loved learning. But now there was a, OK, so if I don't do something new or learn something new every day, then I've just wasted all that mental energy that's, that's being used anyway. Make sense? This is happening. Your brain is expecting you to learn. And it's devised a mechanism to capture that learning in a way that is really, you know, that's great. OK, so 24. 20% in 24 hours. OK, time for you guys to, to do something. Um, I'd just like you to turn to, I mean, just one other person or two other people on your table. Was that you would like to learn? What were you discussing? I'd like to not to call IT when we're having a projection process. All oh, right, so <laughs> more computing skills. Uh -huh. OK, IT skills. Yeah. What else? Another language, yes. Yeah. How to sing. Sorry, how to how sing? To sing. Uh-huh. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, play the piano. Play the piano. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, a, that's really interesting, the kind of things that, you, that you're wanting to learn. So let's just do the what's stopping you. Time. Time. Yep. And, and I'm, I'm going to challenge you on time. Is it time that's stopping you? At the moment. Or is it prioritization that's stopping you? Netflix. It's Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably all know people that use their time just amazingly and do zillions of things with it. So prioritization definitely will stop us. What else? Money. Money? Yep. 
Yeah, if it requires money to do it. Yeah. Confidence. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wanting. 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 Motivation to do it. Absolutely. Yes. Can we learn behaviors? Yes. Absolutely. How would you learn a behavior? <laughs> well, see, this is the lovely thing that what I basically said is that if you want to learn a behavior, you have to create the pathway through your brain for that behavior. And the best way to do that is to practice the behavior. So whatever it is you want to learn, do it do it regularly, and you will create the synapses for that behavior. Where does this link into the stuff that teachers have been using all the time? Hmm? Routine, yeah, creating routine for kids is really important because you, you reduce the amount of learning that they have to do. They're not learning a new way of doing things for learning the content. So you talked about confidence, you talked about your willingness to, to effectively to try. Yeah? This is about fixed and growth mindset. Yeah? If you have a fixed mindset and don't believe that you can, then guess what? You won't. Because you won't put in the practice that you require in order to, to learn the new skill. So having a growth mindset is about not um, necessarily get it, becoming genius at things, but being willing to put in the effort, find the right strategies and persevere. Yeah? And if you do that, then your brain will learn new behaviors, new facts, new whatever it else is that you want. So for me, this is the absolute basis of why growth mindset must be true. Because our brains are doing what we need in order for us to have a growth mindset. If you've got anybody that doesn't believe in growth mindset, tell them this. Because it's the absolute evidence that sits behind the idea of a growth mindset. Yeah. So what, have you, what would you hate to forget that you've already learned? Let's just cover that off too. What sorts of things have you already, that you already do? Speaking English, <laughs> absolutely, yes. All that vocabulary on the, the grammar and that just comes, yeah, absolutely. Many micro, molecular biology techniques that mm. I'm no longer using. Okay, so molecular bio, biology techniques. And you know, it's like, when can you get the opportunity to practice so that you don't lose it completely? Yeah, but riding a bike, you know that when you go back on a bike, it comes back to you. It will be easier to learn the second time in comparison to the first. Yeah, anything else that you'd hate to forget? How to drive? Yeah. Yeah. So what's stopping you? And you know, I just told you all about the plasticity in your brain. The other side of this is that there are mechanisms in your brain that stabilize information as well. Epigenetic mechanisms that make it more difficult for the pathways that you've created to change once you've formed them. And there's a slight downside of that for adults because it means that we put a whole lot of connections in our brains that we don't want to lose and we have to hold those rigid you know all that English learning you don't want it just to you know fritter away if you don't use it for a day or learning to drive or um, your molecular biology techniques so your brain stabilizes those networks and that means that it's slightly more difficult for adults to learn than it is for children Partly because we've already got established networks and partly because our brains are slightly less plastic. Do you all know what I mean by a flow state? You know that, that time when you're working and it, well for me it's if I'm writing and it feels as if the words are coming out of my fingers. I don't feel as if I'm thinking, I just feel as if it's happening. Yeah? That's a flow state and they tend to be states um, where you're You've got maximum challenge, so you're sitting just on the edge of your comfort zone, but you've got the resource to manage the task. Yeah? So it's when you're really challenged, but you're, co you're coping well. Those are times when it looks as if our brains go back to having more neuroplasticity. 
So here's a, a thing for you to take away, you know, in your, when you're, as you're learning to be teachers. Can you recognize where you have those flow states? So I can't tell you where your flow states will develop, but is it at a particular time of day? Is it when you're doing particular kinds of work? Um, is it when you're in a particular place? And if you can start noticing when you go into a flow state and just noting down, well, what happened? You know, what was I doing when I did that? Then you'll be better able to recognize what it is you need to do in order to get back into a flow state. So it's a really good piece of kind of self-learning, self-discovery is where do, where do I get my best flow states? Yeah, um, I think probably my best ones are around a swimming pool, probably in the Caribbean someplace, you know, <laughs> first thing in the morning when it's not too hot. Yeah, yeah, make it up. But you can see that once you know where they are, then you're more likely to be able to get back into them. And that's the sort of thing that you might need um, as practitioners as you're learning. Any questions before I send you off to get a cup of tea and a cup of coffee? Yes. Oh, great question. And the answer is, it depends. So yes, um, have any of you heard of Lamarckian in, in, um, inheritance? So at the same time as Darwin was talking about um, inheritance through this kind of mechanism, um, Lamarck was talking about how giraffes get a long neck. And he was saying, well, you know, they, they eat the tall leaves, and so they, they push their necks, and so the, the parents' necks get a bit longer, and that's passed down to the kids, and the kids' neck gets a bit longer, and that's passed down the generations. And everybody poo pooed it and said, you know, there's no mechanism for Lamarckian inheritance. Epigenetics is a mechanism for Lamarckian inheritance, and some of the things that we do in our adult, in our lives, get passed to our children. So we've made these changes to the DNA. When you create um, sperm and egg, some of those markers will be stripped off. And we don't know why some of them are, are stripped off, but some of them are retained. And that information is then passed on to your children. Um, one place, for instance, that it makes sense to pass the, the, the information on, if you're in a very stressful um, environment and are having to react to, to stress, then the chances are that your children are going to be born into the same environment. So stress reactivity is passed it on in an epigenetic way. Yeah? So there are, there are things, that, but, but that's kind of, we're sitting at the edge of what we know now. That's where we need to kind of find out. Isn't it? Yeah, fascinating. There was another question over here someplace. Somebody else have the hand up? Yeah. yeah. It's horrendous. I mean, that's a form of torture because we're social animals. We, we like to converse with others. We, we like to be stimulated. So putting somebody in a, in a place where you, there's no stimulation at all, you know, that, that your brain, you'd have to go into your inner resource. Now, I know um, some people have managed to get through so, uh, solitary confinement by um, recalling whole books or songs that they know or but you're, you're dependent completely on your ability to stimulate yourself from the inside and, um, and if you don't do that then you're going to lose a lot of synapses yeah not a good thing to do And, and this is part of the difficulty in teaching is that you've got that, that different experience of every child and you're trying to adapt to well, what's right for most of the class and then how do I deal with these exceptional cases. Yeah, yeah, this will have a big impact on how children show up. Mm -hmm.